Hey there, welcome to another session of Coding at Home with the Code Hub. We're going to kick off with arrays again today. We're going to get back to that Learn to Code 2 playground and we're going to explore some of the different ways we can use arrays, find out how we can iterate through them, which is the most useful thing. We can have a list of things. Uh, or we talked yesterday about having like a bucket of things and we might take them out one at a time, do something with that thing, put it aside, and then play with the next thing. That's what we're going to work on today. You can see I've added a new syntax review note here, which is another way of using for loops where we have uh, an array and we iterate through each item. And that's basically, like I said, taking each item out, working with it for a little bit, and then moving on to the next one once we're done. We use that instead of uh, in our previous examples, right? We, we use for i in one dot 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 whatever. Um, the i was actually a variable that we can use inside the for loop. In this case, I, I like to call my variables that I use each time I pass through the loop next, whatever it is. So if I have a, uh, an array of ingredients, I might call it next ingredient. So I know that I'm working on the next one and I'm looping through those things. All right, so let's go, let's go off to the, the book, take a look at where we're at, and then we'll go off to Swift Playgrounds. All right, here we go. We'll just switch to our iPad here. <laughs> We're having our same issues we had yesterday with our, our iPad. So let's try and plug on that one and plug it back in. Let's see if that works. Let's try a different chord. While I'm messing around with that, what you could do is you could open up the book. So open up your books app on your iPad. Still no luck just yet. I know. Let's see if we can get another one working. All right, we'll work on we'll work on our other iPad there for a little bit. Thankfully, I've got a bunch of backups here, so we can kind of switch over quick. All right, so let's take a look. I'm opening up my books application. Now I have, you can see here that I have both uh, Everyone Can Code Puzzles, the Teacher and Student Edition. I'm gonna open the Student Edition. And here we are. So we're on our, our arrays and refactoring. And the whole refactoring, the whole point of refactoring was to pay attention to what code you've written already uh, to go back and read it again. A, a lot of times we might feel like we write that code and then we never go back and look at it again. Uh, we've tried to go over in this course stuff that we've already written. Go back to rock, paper, scissors. Go back to the answers playground. Build on your quiz. Um, this is always a good exercise, especially if you're still, you find that that code is still relevant. Like you still want to write quizzes that your friends will take. Uh, it's useful to go back over that stuff and maybe think about how you can improve it because you now know more than you knew back when you wrote it. I always go back and look at code I wrote a month or two or a year ago and I go, oh man, I could have done that better. I could have done it a different way. Um, that's just, that's how it works. You're always learning new stuff when you're, you're programming. So we're, we're looking at our, the playgrounds that we have to work through. We did storing information. Let's go look at iteration exploration and we'll see a little bit of that, um, the syntax that I showed you in the, the beginning. So let's open up Swift Playgrounds. All right, so I'm on, I'm on Swift Playgrounds. I'm gonna open up my Learn to Code 2. 
Unfortunately, I have to download it on this iPad. All right, we'll give that a second to download. All right, so while that's downloading, you may be stuck in the same situation waiting for something to download. That happens. I'm just gonna try playing around with the other iPad for a second. Nope, no such luck on my Code Hub iPad. Let's try adding a new video source here. Oh, I've definitely done something with my poor old device here. All right, so we're going to wait for that to download. While we're waiting for that to download, we'll let's let's go back to the book for a second and walk through some of the other items we might find interesting here. So, in the student edition, we actually have some information about the the playgrounds that we're going to be playing with. So, this is the one that we did yesterday. So we were able to tap on the blocks and see which row we wanted things to appear in. Or actually it wasn't the row, it was the column. Now in the playground that we're gonna be working on today, when that, that playground uh, downloads, we'll be working through first identifying the goal. We always read that goal first. We will actually here, let's try one little trick. Before we move on. We're just sending the playground from one iPad to the next. We'll see if that works a little bit better than what we've been trying to do. But this is like the other puzzle that we we did yesterday. The row is always going to be one. Uh, we can tap on the, the squares again and see the values on screen. So we'll see the, the column and the row. So 0, 1, 0, 0. Oh, and we're receiving something from our other iPad. Okay, cool. So I'm going to actually open up this one that I just shot over from the other iPad. This is Learn to Code 2. It's going to start me out at the very beginning. So what I'm going to do is go up to the top and I'm going to join you guys because we're already down here in the array section. If I tap on storing information, this is where we left off yesterday. We'll wait for that to load. Wait a bit longer. Things are moving a little slow. I think it's a Friday for the iPad as well. And here, we're actually going to try backing out of this playground and opening it up again. Uh, 
Uh, no such luck. So you can see, I know a few of you have suffered the same kind of issues while you've been trying to follow along. Maybe, maybe the iPad's been running a little bit slow. Maybe you're running on an older device like this one that I have here. Uh, this iPad's probably four, four years old, I think. All right, so now we're on the storing information. This is where we left off yesterday. What we had to do was work with these rows here, this var rows, and we needed to add numbers for the row where we wanted to place a character. And this method here, this place or this function, place characters at rows, would take that array of rows and then place our characters. So let's run our code just to sit, remind ourselves what it did. This is the one we played around with and added an extra number, which we called an integer because it's a whole number. There's no decimal point in it. We added an extra number anyway, beyond the number of rows that we have. So we have six rows here. I have zero to six for my row numbers. And you'll remember, maybe, maybe you won't, that we discussed yesterday that when we start counting items in an array, we actually start at zero. So instead of there being six, because that's my highest number, it's actually seven items in this array. All right, so we wait for that to, to think about it to run. So let's go back and let's go forward again to try it out, see if we can get it to actually run here. And hopefully you remember what happened yesterday when we did run it. Actually, tell you what, we're going to swap over. As fun as it is to watch that, that iPad sort of struggle with uh, our playground. Let's let's go back to our old friendly one with my, my pointer so that I can show you guys what I'm pointing at. All right, so I'm going to open up Learn to Code 2, Copy 3, Storing Information. Now I'm going to try running this code here. We've got our, you know, same code. We're going to run that, that code. Cool. We're placing bytes in all of those rows, even the one off the edge. And we could try adding a seven and an eight and a million if we want. Go ahead and try it out. You're not going to break anything. The iPad might, the Swift Playgrounds might crash, but it's pretty resilient. I don't think you'll uh, run into too much trouble. So what we're going to do. So we're going to hit next page to go on to the next page. So this is iteration exploration. So this is the one we were just talking about in the book. So our challenge here is to iterate over an array, placing a gem and a switch at each location. So this is definitely worth reading through the directions. And these videos uh, hopefully are hopeful because helpful because I walk you through the the code and, and what to do. Um, if you get stuck and you're on your own and for whatever reason you can't watch the videos back, um, go have, I highly recommend reading the text here. They've done a really good job at Apple of explaining what's going on in each playground and what the, the goal is and how to accomplish that goal. So it mentions, we've talked about iterating and iteration. They, they define that for you, which is kind of nice. And it's just the act of repeating a process. It talks to you about for loops, which we know a little bit about. And then we can see here they use a for loop saying for current column in columns. So they, they prefer using current instead of next, which is fair enough. 
world.place. Now remember, the world, we have an instance of a world, which is this whole thing here. Place is a method on that type of world. And it's got a few parameters we can pass it. We can pass a gem. And this is uh, creating a new gem because it's a capital G. So it's using that gem type uh, at column. And then the column we want to use is the current column. And then the row is always one because this is the first, the only, the only row. Well, there's three rows, but this one is in the middle. You can see we've got our second row, middle row, and then the very first one, which is zero in arrays. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to complete the for loop that iterates over our array. So first, let's give this a name. So they use current column. I'm going to use my own preference, and I'm going to say next column. And the array name is called, we actually have a variable here that's an array of integers called columns. So we're going to say, okay, so we want to iterate through columns. And it gives me the completion down here. Now we want to place a gem at the column. Well, we have to name this our variable there. And the really nice thing is that the autocomplete bar will use my the variable name that I chose down here. So I can hit next column at row one. So let's try running this. Cool, there are our gems. Not bad. Now we can pick our hint, our hint kind of pulse status there. So they give you a good reminder, use camel case when we're naming our variable for the for loop. And it's called, this is technically called a for in loop because you're saying for each one of these in an array. And they give some examples like, oh, current column, column would be a good name, column just on its own would be a good name. Each column would be a good name. We have a few other hints here. This is how they kind of thought it out. This is a good technique as well to use when you're coding, when you're trying to solve a problem. Write out the for loop and give your variables, you know, you'll have a variable that's an array. Create your variable that you're gonna use inside here and then write it out in plain text to say, well, what do I want to do? This is what I want to do for this particular puzzle inside this loop. Okay, so that's play, world place gem to place a gem. And then if we scroll over, so there's no solution. But what it's asking for is in step two here is place a gem and a switch. All right, so let's, let's tap on the end of this, hit return. And we're basically going to use the same thing here. So we're going to do world dot place. So I'm going to go find world in my autocomplete bar. So world dot place. And you can see some other kind of cool looking functions in there. Place item. So what do I, I want to create a switch, right? Well, I can see that I have a portal type and we know that it's a type because it's capitalized capital P. These two are variables. I can't use those or can I? There's a capital B for block, capital C for character, capital C for coordinate. That's another type that we'll see in a little bit. Expert gem, but what do we want? We want a switch. So here's our switch. I can grab my parentheses from here in the autocomplete bar. Now I want to place it at a certain column. And I want to place it in a certain row. Okay, will I run it and see what happens? All right, there are gems. Ooh, that's kind of funky. What happened there? Where's my bug? Can anyone spot my bug? So we've placed... We can also see that our world is a little bit more interesting than just the shapes we're seeing on the screen. I placed switches way over here because I misplaced my column and my row. So let me swap those around. So I, we, we were told up here that we want to place them only it's 
row one that we're working in. So I want to replace that with a one. And I want to replace this one with a next column. So we're going to delete that. And we'll tap on the next column down here in the autocomplete bar. So now let's try running our code and see what happens. Cool. So we place the gem and a switch, gem and a switch, gem and a switch, gem and a switch, gem and a switch. So we iterated over the array. Now this is kind of interesting. I like this puzzle a lot because it shows you how this is getting run. So we can see that when we ran it, we had the gem up here first. Yep. Cool. Then we had a switch up here at that first column. And then we went and we had a gem up here and then a switch, gem up here and a switch, gem up here and a switch, all the way down. So we were working on the same column the whole way down. Now, if we wanted to draw all the gems first and then all the switches, we could do that a couple of different ways. We could, but what well, one thing we could do is we could copy this, paste it. Okay, take out the gem part because we don't want to. Two gems twice. I'd probably change my comment there too because the comment isn't right either. So if I wanted to do all the gems first and then all the switches underneath, what I would do is this and I would say, all right, let's get rid of this because I'm only placing a gem. So I'm going to get rid of switch, place a gem for each column. And then in this one, I would delete gem. So I'm going to place a switch for each column. It's helpful to update your comments while you're updating your code, because otherwise people will go read your comments and say, wait a second. Or you might read your comments later and say, wait, what just happened? So you can see now, and this might be behavior you want to get, is you have to think about what's taking place inside your loops. So I actually looped through columns twice and placed gems the first time. And then the second time I went and placed switches. So it's, it's a different way of solving the problem. And maybe if that's the look that I wanted to get instead of placing a gem and then a switch and then a gem and then a switch, um, I wanted a slightly different look. So, okay. So, so far, all we've done is we've had arrays of numbers like this, which might be a little bit confusing because remember we had, when we wanted to access something in an array, we would use an index. And we would do something like we'd have code that look, would look like this. So I would have my array. And then if I wanted to access an, an individual item, I would use this square bracket. And then if I wanted to get the first item in the list, I would use a zero. Well, it just so happens that if I say column zero, the value for that is zero. So that's, it might be a little bit confusing because if, if this were something else like a like an eight, oops, that's not an eight. Now the value for column zero is is eight, not zero. So that might be a little confusing, but so far that's all we've been using is arrays of numbers. Let's move on to the next playground page to try out an array that doesn't use just numbers. Okay, so now our goal here is to place five stacked blocks at each corner. So we're going to, this corner, this one, this one, and this one, we'll place some blocks. So if we tap on that, that's zero, zero, that's zero, three, that's three, three, and that's three, zero. So we're going to have to write some code to stack five blocks up on each one of those corners. So, and it mentions here, instead of an array of ints, we have an array of coordinates now. So we have this coordinate type and an instance of a coordinate just references a location. So it's going to have a property for both the column and the row. So this coordinate type is a really handy way for us to refer to this zero comma zero or three comma zero. If you've ever done any of my other classes with turtle graphics, we've talked about coordinates a lot and where you wind up on a particular screen. Okay, so we have this block locations array. It's a variable that we've defined. 
We're going to iterate over each coordinate and perform an action at each location. So this is a good example. So for coordinate in block locations, we're going to place a gem at whatever coordinate. Okay, so we're going to add two coordinates to block locations, one for each remaining corner of the world. All right, so that's the first thing we have to do. So we have to, and it says here, insert new coordinate. So let's do that. So it's kind of nice because we have a couple examples just above us. We have a way to instantiate a coordinate. Remember, a, a, a type is the blueprint, and then a, an actual copy of that type is called an instance. So we have that the character type, and then if we have a, an actual byte running around the playground, that's an instance of our character type. So we have to create an instance of our coordinate by using the coordinate type. And we're going to use an initializer. We'll tap on the parentheses there. And then this is a special initializer where we can pass in the column and row we want to give that coordinate. So let's tap on that in the autocomplete bar. Now we have the, co the um, coordinate at 0, comma 0. We also have the one at three comma three. So now we need the one at zero. I'll tap on the next int comma three. And then you'll notice that each of these items in the array, because here's the, here's the start of the array. It's not all on one line. They put the square bracket. They have the first item. Then they have a comma here. Then they have a, the next item and then a comma at the end of that. Now, if I were leaving this as it is, and I only had three items in my array, I wouldn't put a comma at the very end, at the last one. But I want to add a new one. So I'll hit comma, and I'll add another one by doing the same thing we just did. Tap on coordinate. Use the parentheses. Tap again on my autocomplete to get this signature. The special syntax of the initializer with the, the parameters and everything that you can pass in is called the signature. Um, we can call it, use the same language to talk about methods that have parameters. When you look at the, the parameter label and then the value that you pass in, that's all part of the signature of the method, just what it looks like. All right, so the other column is three and zero is the row that we want to add in. All right, so now we have our four four corners defined in our block locations variable. We have a for loop started for us. It says for coordinate in array name. Well, what's our array name here? This is block locations, right? So let's tap on block locations or let's tap on array name and then pick block locations from down here in the autocomplete bar. Now, there was an example up here for coordinate and block locations, world.place gem at coordinate. Well, let's try that. So we're going to tap inside the block. Now I'm writing code that's going to happen every single time for every single one of these coordinates. So I'm going to go grab a world from way over here. World dot. Where's our place? So we have a few few choices here. So if we look, see, we have this place item at coordinate, and this is the one that we want. We also have another method on our world called place item facing at coordinate, which is kind of cool, because you can now specify, hey, I want this item to show up, and I want it to be facing west. This might be useful if we have an expert, and we have a lock that they need to pick. But let's pick our first one. So place item. We won't worry about the item yet, but what we'll do is we're going to use this coordinate variable. So we're going to place whatever we decide here at that coordinate. Well, we're doing blocks, so let's do blocks. We're going to use the, hit the parentheses down there. Let's try running it. Let's see what we have. All right. Okay, cool. All right, so we placed one block 
at each one of these coordinates. But we want to place, the goal is to place 5, right? Okay, well, how would we place 5 of the same thing? We could take all of this and duplicate it 5 times. But I'm, I'm kind of a lazy programmer, as we all know by now. I want to, let's use a loop. This sounds like a prime opportunity for using a loop. So let's hit return here. Let's use a for loop. So we're going to go down to four, tap on that. For i in one dot 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 number, well, we want to do it five times. And it's asking for my code in there. What I'm going to do is I've already written the code. So I'm going to tap on this, these two, and drag it down. Okay. So now what should happen is for every coordinate, so for this first one, 0, 0, I'm going to go into this block, and then I'm immediately going to hit a, another for loop. So you remember when we talked about reading code earlier in the week, now I'm inside these two braces. So first I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on this and do this five times. So and that coordinate won't, won't change. It'll be zero comma zero the whole time. So once I'm done with that, then I'm going to get to the end. Oh, last brace. I'm going to go back up to the top and say, oh, I need my next coordinate. I'm going to grab this one here, three comma three. I'm going to get go inside here to start executing the code. I'm going to say, okay, well, for I and I got to do this five times. This is what I'm focused on. So let's let's try that. We're going to step through our code to watch this happen. Okay, we're dropping into the loop. So we're doing this five times. We place our second block, our third block. Cool. At first, second. Third, fourth, fifth. You can see our tower is kind of growing there. There's our next corner going up. This would be a great way to build a house in Minecraft, if that's still your thing. And then here comes our last one. We're working on our last coordinate. So we did it. So perfect. All right. So we've, we completed that. This is a fun one to play around with. Um, this is sort of a pain to type in all your coordinates. There was another handy method that you might have noticed when we were looking for autocompletes at the end of world. So let's check that out. Say we wanted all coordinates. Maybe we wanted to cover this map with water instead of blocks. Let's try that out. So to get all coordinates, I could create an array and add all of these, but there's actually a really handy little property on world. I'll hit the dot called all possible coordinates. That's going to give me back an array of all these coordinates on the grid. So instead of this, let's change this code a little bit. So we'll use all coordinates instead of block locations. Let's run our code and see what happens. And we'll run it a bit faster because this may, may take a little while. Okay. We're looping through all coordinates and we're adding five blocks on every single coordinate. Kind of cool. Uh, we could say, actually, do you know what? We want to delete that and we'd rather do world dot place our item. Let's see, what's our item going to be? We could place, um, let's do a little water world here. Now, if I leave off And I'll use coordinate because remember, coordinate is going to change every single time I run through this loop. If I leave off the parentheses for my water type, I'll hit the the error 
thing and I'll say, oh, uh, all right, expected member name or constructor call after type name. This might sound like gibberish to you. We have a couple options. We can either add arguments after the type to construct a value of the type, use dot self to reference the type object. Let's try fixing it with the first one. Let's see what happens there. Oh, cool. Well, that fixed it for us by just adding the parentheses. So that's the initializer to give me back an instance of my water type. So let's try running this. We'll hit run faster and see what happens. Okay, well, nothing happened. So maybe, maybe we're not able to place water. Let's try doing it with a portal just for kicks. Uh, we're missing a color. Okay, so look, I tried to insert a portal without a, a parameter for my initializer. So now I can hit fix and it'll give me an option to fill this in. I can tap on color and get a color swatch. Will we just create a yellow one maybe? Let's try running that. Oh, we had a problem running our page. It's worth playing around with this because later on in this, in this arrays section, we'll be able to create our own world and, and um, you know, build rivers and stuff through our, our, whole, um, our whole scene. Oh, so there's our first portal. You can see I'm going through all possible coordinates and putting portals on absolutely every one of them. This is a really fun tool in your programming toolbox, this for in loop. Um, I highly recommend playing around with it. We'll be moving on to some of the other playgrounds like getting in order, and then we'll be doing fixing index out of range errors, which is another big one. A big part of our job as programmers and coders is to fix the bugs that we, we or others make. And those are our last two playgrounds. So over the weekend, it'd be great if you could practice a little bit, maybe build your own world, send me some pictures of a, a world that's all portals like this one. That's pretty, pretty impressive, kind of cool looking. Um, yeah, see what you can create with playing around with either all coordinates or block locations and specifying exact locations yourself by tapping on the, the tile and figuring out the coordinates. And, um, and we'll see you Monday. All right. Thanks for joining us.